Hi, I'm William Kent Kruger, author of Ordinary Grace and the New York Times bestselling Cork O'Connor Mystery Series. And you are listening or watching the mendacious, is that really a word? Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to legendary photographer Herb Snitzer. Stick around. If Miles Davis could, he would. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview. The show is brought to you today by Amazon.com, the world's greatest store for everything from books and movies to computers, TVs, and even my favorite soft drink, Pepsi Wild Cherry. Thinking about buying something online from Amazon or just want to do a little window shopping? You can save yourself a lot of money and help support Mr. Media, that's me, by clicking on one of the Amazon ads at MrMedia.com and start your shopping with us. Get yourself the new iPad or Kindle Fire. Feeling a little racy today? Amazon's got what you need to feel exciting and new, as they used to sing on The Love Boat. Remember, start your next shopping trip from the comfort of your own home, car, hotel, or office with Amazon.com at MRmedia.com. That's right, MrMedia.com. And folks, thanks for your support. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of cool chicks and hep cats searching for the right jazzy groove in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Why deny it? St. Petersburg, Florida still makes a great place to retire. This grand city by the Bay of ours presents a more modern image of itself as the home of the Grand Prix, the Salvador Dali Museum, and the Tampa Bay Rays baseball franchise. But make no doubt, we still attract an awful lot of folks on the run from a lifetime of cold weather. Now, one of the reasons that men and women of a certain class of creative folks find their way here is the opportunity to work with the students and faculty at Eckerd College, a small liberal arts institution ensconced on a beautiful spit of prime waterfront land. Now, more than two decades ago, novelist James Michener made the campus kind of his second home and enhanced the community by teaching and presenting seminars on his craft through the Academy of Senior Professionals. And one of the more recent professionals, uh, to follow in Michener's footsteps here, is legendary magazine photographer, Herb Snitzer. Now, Snitzer began his career in Manhattan in 1957, and his work appeared prominently over the years in all the magazines and the newspapers that mattered during his era. We're talking about Life, Look, Saturday Evening Post, uh, Fortune, Time, The New York Times, The Herald Tribune. He also made his mark in the world of music, capturing enduring images of Miles Davis, Nina Simone, Duke Ellington, uh, John Coltrane, and Count Basie. And more recently, and as a resident of the Tampa Bay area now, his work as a civil rights activist has brought him even more renown. Now, Eckerd College's Cobb Gallery is featuring a retrospective of his work, Herb Snitzer, A Life in Photography, through April 5, 2013. Snitzer will be featured in a gallery talk on Monday, April 1st at 2 p.m., and will also appear at a closing reception on Friday, April 5th. And for more information, you can call 727-864-7979 or visit the website www.eckerd.edu slash events. And Herb Snitzer, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Nice to have you here. And I, I suspect that my talk and references to retirement might make you bristle a little because you seem too busy to actually retire. Well, I never thought that I did retire, and I don't see retirement as being something in uh, my future. You know, I have this idea that artists never retire, we just die. 
<laughs> and uh, I suspect that will be the case with me as well, because uh, I'm not quite sure what I would be retiring from. Because it's not it's not work if you enjoy it, is it? It's not work. It's not. It, you're absolutely right. It's something that I love doing, and uh, they have a uh, wet dark room here at Eckerd College, which I am now using, and it's just a joy to be in there and to bring up this image of Louis Armstrong that I made over 50 years ago. He and I have a conversation. <laughs> I think I want to have this. Com- I think I want to have our conversation in that dark room now. I want to eavesdrop. Well, that that you won't be able to do, but you can rest assured that Lewis is well and still blowing hard. All right. Good to hear Satchmo's doing okay. I'm That's glad. right. And uh, did you tell me I, – I, correct, correct me if I got this wrong. Did you tell me the other day that uh, you you have not taken up with digital, that you've uh, – You've, you've stuck to analog photography, if you will? Yeah, that's that's correct. I don't even use a digital camera. I use a film mm-hmm. and process the film, make the prints on silver gelatin paper. And uh, I just, uh, some might say I'm stuck in the old ways, but I happen to think that uh, it, it's just a, a beautiful way to make a piece of art. You know, I'm not in a hurry. Have you tried digital at all? I'm just curious. I have used a digital camera once, and um, it it just didn't have the same resonance for me that a regular film camera has. And again, it may be because of my age. It could be because of my uh, uh, professional experiences that uh, I just... Um, there's a flow to photography, especially as a documentary photographer, which is how I c- categorize myself. There's a flow to how images are made. And with digital, you know, you snap the shutter and then you look. You snap the shutter and then you look. And between the snapping of the shutter and the looking is that actually when the the image is being made only you're not making it because you're too intent on just looking at what you've just done mm-hmm. whereas for me I could knock off 36 exposures in a very short period of time but I'm actually physically working with the subject matter at that po- at that time no, you follow well, yeah you're, no I do yeah. and one of the early complaints I think about digital was that uh, the earlier cameras they didn't uh, you couldn't go click, 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 click. You know, you couldn't keep, keep right, it going. Right. There was I mean, that, that's, that's changed now, I think. Oh, oh, sure it is. With the new high-end Canon and Nikons, there's no, there's no delay even with uh, digital cameras. I mean, when you're spending $2,000 a camera, yeah. you, you better get what you want, uh, especially as a, I would think uh, – these young brave war photographers are all now using digital of course because they have to transport the film i mean i'm sorry the image as quickly as possible and those cameras you can't have a delay not in uh, combat what uh if you had had the ability let's forget about the digital aspect but in terms of the the quality or the the feel of the film itself the 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 photo that results from it but if uh, 40 or 50 years ago, if you had had the ability to instantly take that picture and transmit it, would that have changed anything uh, about, about your career, do you think? Well, I would think it would change the entire world of photography, sure. Yeah, of course. Of course it would. There's, uh, it's like I don't use glass plates which is what they used uh, during Civil War days, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, the medium is evolving. I mean, for the first time since the invention of photography, you're not using a wet process. Mm. Nothing being, quote unquote, developed. It's already there. And, uh, and so the digital uh, phenomenon, the technological breakthrough is just uh, wonderful. And I I think uh, photography is it's it's the youngest of all art media. My my career or my life in photography encompasses almost one third the entire history of the medium. Mm. Interesting. When so you think about it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it really does. And uh, uh, what will happen 20 years from now, 30 years, 50 years from now, I, I'm in no position to even guess at it, nor is anybody else, because if you talked about iPads and Skype 25 years ago, people would think you were crazy. Right, right. Or you were Dick Tracy with the talking watch. Well, that's what I'm looking forward to. I can't wait to get my yeah, uh, my I, Apple I, iWatch. You know, I think that'll be great. Well, you never listen. I wouldn't put it past anybody to for the kind of technological. Uh, magic that has occurred over the past 20 years. Oh, I fully expect to have a video phone on my wrist very soon. Look, it, it, it's like, it, it's really interesting. Uh, in 1978, I took a job with Polaroid Corporation. I was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, here was a company that was like $500 million in uh, income and assets and so on. They In 1978, they did not have one computer in the entire company. And they assigned a vice president to find out whether it would be feasible to introduce computers into the workforce. I mean, 1978, wow. not very long ago. Yeah. And, and, and of course, they had their own troubles, you know, with instant stuff and then they're now basically out of business but in 1978 they were still deliberating whether to introduce a computer does it make you sad at all that kodak and polaroid have gone the way of the dodos for the most part i mean it's phenomenal to even think that it could have happened but i mean it has happened yes it has and if you take a look at the fortune 500 of uh, 50 years ago and 30 years ago Completely different companies. They come and go. They're not as secure as they once were. And uh, no, I don't have any nostalgia for Kodak. Uh, um, I do for Kodachrome. Mm. Uh, that was one of the, if not the best, color uh, uh, films ever produced. It was wonderful. But otherwise, no, same thing with uh, Polaroid. I mean, these companies come and go, and I'm sure they don't think very much about Herb Snitzer. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's, a, that's fair. That's fair. Before the, the, the digital uh, photo revolution, if you will, what was, over the course of your career, what was the biggest technological leap for you to to you know at, in, you know I mean a, a young photographer today is coming in and basically they're just using they're using digital that's what that's what the medium is today when yeah. you came in obviously you, using a different type of camera but uh, you know what was the big jump for you in terms of technology motor drive oh really when they introduced the motor drive integrated in the camera it used to be uh, it was a separate element that you would attach to your camera and then when they were able to perfect batteries right in the camera itself made all the difference in the world hmm. yeah I, I, I do recall it used to be you would uh, uh, kind of attach it and screw it on screw it in yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I got a little, you know, I got a little yeah, gray here too, I, I've been around you're getting up there too, I didn't realize that, uh, I'm okay. around, I've got a I've actually got a table over here my, my daughter's very interested in photography and, and video and we pulled out all the old uh, uh, still cameras and and uh, uh, my wife's and, and my, my, my late father's. And so we've got them all here trying to figure out what to do with them. <laughs> well, there are people who collect old uh, camera and hardware relating to, uh, I mean, I'm sure if you bring it up online, you'll have no trouble. Oh, yeah. I think, I think my daughter's actually, her interest in, is to try them out and see, you know, what kind of... Uh, uh, you know what kind of images result from those versus what she gets from her uh, her Nikon uh, digital, for example, which, mm -hmm. which she's very good with, by the way, just for what it's worth. So, uh, tell me about the uh, uh, tell me about the show at at Eckerd College at Cobb Gallery. What uh, you know? What are some of the highlights? What are you you know? What are you most proud of, and what will people see? Well, the thing that I like more than anything else is that it shows other aspects of my photography uh, than uh, the jazz images. Mm. I, I have this modest reputation for 
my jazz images, uh, which have become really met some of, many of them iconic. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones of Miles Davis right. and Nina Simone, Lester Young outside the five spot. Uh, um, but I have done more. I, I have a career of over 50 years, so um, which reflects itself in the exhibition. It shows uh, portraits of very well-known people that I have had the privilege to meet. Uh, it shows uh, personal uh, photographs of nature that I was influenced by Aaron Siskin, the, the great American photographer who was a mentor. Uh, and uh, so I had this opportunity to show, and again, uh, it's only about 36 pictures. So I have a 50-year career, so we're talking about a picture a year, you know, right. or thereabouts. But um, it, it shows a broader interest and concern for uh, humanity. I consider myself a documentary photographer. Mm -hmm. I also consider myself a visual historian because I'm not just making photographs for today. I've made photographs which have lasted 50 years, which are still as powerful now as when I first met, uh, made them. Mm -hmm. And I just feel blessed that I was able to do that because, you know, at one time I was young. <laughs> you know? At one time? What does that mean? Remember that? Aren't you still? And, Come on now. And uh, so... Uh, you know, making this iconic photograph of Lester, of uh, Louis Armstrong with the Star of David around his neck. Uh, um, I was 27 years old on a bus with uh, Louis Armstrong. Well, it, um, it had great significance, civil rights significance, mm -hmm. you know, of this uh, black performer with the Star of David who always seemed to have a Jewish bass player <laughs> you know, coming out of uh, how he obtained that star of David, which is one of those wonderful stories of people caring for other people. He was given that star of David by the Karnofsky family in New Orleans, who took him in and gave him uh, food and shelter and clothing. And one birthday, gave him this Star of David, which he wore his entire life. Wow. was buried with it. Wow. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was significant of, uh, you know, some of humanity taking place. And that's what I always tried to get into my images, not, not just uh, to show Louis Armstrong, but to show a facet of Louis Armstrong, which um, was... Uh, uh, different than what the general public would have seen of him. You know, they always, well, I, I shouldn't generalize, but too many times people think of Louis Armstrong as this strutting, wide-eyed uh, uh, black man, minstrel almost, right. you know, but he wasn't that at all, not in my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I tried to capture what I felt about about him as a person. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is, is you actually took me there, is uh, you know, the public sees the photo that captures the moment, and, and that's, you know, the, like you said, there's a, the iconic photo. I saw the, there's the Miles Davis shot that's truly iconic that everyone recognizes when they see. Right. Um, what I'm wondering is, can you pick out a couple of other moments, uh, it doesn't have to be the jazz photos, any, anything, where uh, you can take us to what led up to that moment? Sure. Well, a recent one, which happened down here in what was you categorized as sleepy St. Petersburg. I didn't say uh, sleepy. No, no, no. I never said sleepy. Oh, well, Don't get the Chamber of Commerce on my well, ass. I, I, that's the last <laughs> thing I want to do. This is my hometown. Right. But uh, a few years ago, there was a Klan rally on the steps of City Hall here in St. Petersburg. Hmm. KKK rally. I mean, I, I, was, I thought I was in a time warp. But there they were in their goony uniforms, you know, <laughs> with their pinhead coverings over their eyes. And, and I saw 
um, not among them, but to the side, this uh, Nazi. Hmm. He was dressed in uh, in in a T-shirt that uh, had something to do with cyclone gas and got Jews and. I mean, it was unbelievable, you know. So I walked up to him. I had my cameras, and I walked up to him. And as I approached him at the very last minute, because I figured he wasn't going to hurt me because there were just too many police around. I mean, and I, as a former photojournalist, I figured this is this is it. This is where it's happening. He thrusts his middle finger up into the air and opens his mouth and shouts at me, you know. And, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is just too perfect, man. And <laughs> I'm just shooting away, you know. <laughs> and uh, out of it came just a wonderful photograph of this hateful young man, you know, which he doesn't realize that he's immortalized for a long time. And... Uh, and I just, uh, it's those kinds of moments that uh, were very exciting. I, I've, uh, I've always, I've had a lot of friends who, I mean, as a journalist, I mean, had a lot of friends and spent a lot of time with photographers over the years. My roommate, uh, when I first moved to Clearwater, I think my second roommate was a photographer and we used to cover a lot of concerts together for the uh, newspapers and magazines. So we were always together, and I was always in the dark room with him. And 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 being around him later, I I, I was a stringer for the St. Pete Times, and I started I bought a camera and I started shooting some of my own stuff. It just seemed, you know, it 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 uh, it made sense. So I mean, I've always been fascinated with not just the the end result, but that moment that leads up to it. So I, I love that story because you know, people don't get that. I mean. I, it's, I guess that's one, that might be one of the biggest differences today. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking if, if I'm a young photographer today, I'm being called upon by newspapers and magazines to not just snap the image and, and transmit it uh, through whatever transmission you know they're using, but in a lot of times I may be called upon to write or, 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 or dictate what happened before the shot or what was going on probably a lot more so than, than you were, uh, you know, a generation ago. Well, I, I don't know. I, I certainly uh, was very taken by the process of making an image, you know. It wasn't just making or snapping the shutter. Mm. It was really, uh, who was this person? What is it all about? What's going on? What can I say in a way that makes sense and... Uh, all these kinds of things are going on in my head, and, and uh, I try to find out as much about the people that I'm, I was photographing. As an example, uh, the New York Times uh, commissioned me to spend a number of days with Tennessee Williams and Betty Davis when uh, Broadway was in rehearsal for the Night of the Iguana, the great uh, Tennessee Williams play. Mm -hmm. um, so people were saying to me, be very careful about Betty Davis. She's getting older. She's getting wrinkled. Uh, she don't get too close. Be careful what you say. Well, I knew that she had left her young son, Michael Merrill, in California with her then husband Gary Merrill. So during one of the breaks I sat next to her and I turned to her and I said it must be very difficult being away from your son. And she turned and looked at me and I thought oh my god did I make a mistake here. She became a mom. Ah. I was able to then make any photograph I wanted to make. I could get as close to her as I wanted to get because we made this human connection mm -hmm. about her son. Well, parenthetically, 25 years later, I'm living in Boston, and I know that there's a city councilman by the name of Michael Merrill. And I figure, well, I wonder if it's the same kid grown up. Mm -hmm. So I called him because he was in the phone book. And I called him and I said, you don't know me. I'm a photojournalist. And I had the opportunity many years ago to photograph Betty Davis. Is she your mother? 
was she your mother? And there was this silence on the phone. And, and then he said, yes, that was my mother. Wow. And uh, so I made a little photograph that I had made 30 years before of her. And I sent it to him. And, and, and it was just one of those moments, one of those human connections, you know, when, and, and it was the human connection within the silence that uh, I was very taken by when he, said, when he wouldn't answer right away and then said, yes, she was my mother. Yeah, it's a great story. It's a great story. Yeah. I, 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 it reminded me of um, several years ago here in uh, Tampa. Maybe you were, you were probably here at that time. Uh, uh, Channel 8, WFLA, uh, the TV, uh, the NBC affiliate, had a news uh, uh, news director. His name was Stephen Bogart. Humphrey's son? Humphrey's son, son yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, So I, it, it, it's funny how, uh, you know, we lose track of, uh, you know, if they don't go into show business, they become regular folks. and Regular folks, regular indeed, folks. doing regular things. Interesting, very right. interesting. Um, well, let me, let me take you back a little further now. Um, 1957, you get out of college, you move to New York. Um, what were you expecting your life to be, and, and did, it, did it turn out differently than you imagined it as a young man? Well, I, when I first moved to New York, um, I, I, was, I worked uh, as a uh, furniture designer, oh. not as a photographer. Hmm. Um, and I thought that, that I would be an interior designer, furniture designer, but I was making photographs. And I know when I think back at that time, I really wanted to do something important. I mean, that's how I felt, that, that I wanted my life to be so when I look back on it that I did some important things. Uh, and however I use the word important, I mean, it was just, when I think back, it, it was almost somewhat pretentious. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah, you, you, you want to have but, do something that has an impact, I think. Yeah, that that's how I felt, and uh, and, and you know, and then I said to myself, I don't want to do this furniture stuff. I just don't want to do be an interior designer. I want to be a, a photojournalist. Mm. So that's what happened. And was there a single break, or were there a series of breaks that that made it possible? Well, when I, my senior thesis, I went to the Philadelphia College of Art, which is now the University of the Arts, mm -hmm. and my senior thesis was on the Philadelphia Orchestra with Eugene Ormandy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I spent uh, uh, almost a half, a, well, a whole semester photographing and documenting uh, the orchestra. So that when I then left, Philadelphia went to New York, uh, and I decided I wanted to uh, photograph. I had all these pictures of the orchestra and, and of other things as well. I called up Arnold Newman, who was a great environmental portrait photographer. Um, and I told him who I am, and I said, I'm looking for a job. And he, he said, well, have you, I, have you photographed? I said, yeah, I have a full portfolio. So he hired me, $40 a week, wow. second assistant to carry his lights. <laughs> and I snapped it up. <laughs> because back then, 40 bucks a week, you could actually live on $40 a week. Braggart. what I did. <laughs> And, uh, and I worked with him for three months. He was very difficult, very demanding. Mm -hmm. I learned a great deal, but I just had to get out of there. It was just very hard on me emotionally. Mm -hmm. So I, I then got another job with a photographer by the name of Bob Ritter, who was a commercial photographer. And I learned all kinds of things from him. And... Uh, and his agent took one of my pictures and sold it to a insurance company for six hundred dollars. Wow! Well, six hundred dollars in 1957. Let me tell you, that was a lot of money. So I thought, wow, 
I'm just going to break out on my own and, and see what I can do. Well, I didn't sell a picture for two months wow. <laughs> after after that. But I, I persevered and I, I did this uh, series of photographs uh, on Central Park. And uh, one thing led to another and I was introduced to the curator, uh, Grace Mayer, at the Museum of the City of New York. And... Uh, who remained a friend for her entire life. And uh, she gave me a huge museum show, wow. which just blew my mind. I mean, there I was, uh, you know, 26 years old, 27 years old, and all of this starting to happen. And uh, uh, it seemed one thing led to another, meeting certain people led to another incident. and. And uh, that, I was on a roller coaster, and I thought, "Wow, this, this, I just hope this never ends." <laughs> you know, well, but of course it does. Wow. And, uh, uh, but it, it was exciting, and uh, and I have no regrets as far as the photographic uh, stuff that I've done, the worlds that I've lived in, the people that I've met. Mm -hmm. I don't have any regrets at all. Who were your contemporaries in the city at that time? Uh, photographers. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce Davidson, Gary Winogrand, um, Lottie Jacobs, uh, Ruth Orkin. There, there was quite a an act. At w. Eugene Smith, the great uh, war photographer. Um, Robert Frank. This uh, and. Uh, you know, we we all hung out. Steve Shapiro, we hung out. A lot of Jewish guys <laughs> went into photography. I don't, not quite sure why, but uh, there seems to be a distinct connection between uh, photography and uh, uh, Jewish photographers. I, I'm going to take a wild guess that some of it has to do with it. it if you go into photography, you, a lot of times you wind up working for yourself which in, in certain eras has probably been better for Jewish men than to try to get hired by someone uh, who might reject you just based on being Jewish? Possible. That, that's, I never thought of it that way, but yeah. The, the, there was certainly, uh, even in New York, there was uh, uh, anti-black, anti-Semitism. There's a lot of... The, the transformation of America in the past 50 years, uh, somebody needs to write that book. Mm. I mean, it's just uh, extraordinary young kids today, like with the gay marriage thing. I mean, 50, 60 years ago, you had Stonewall. You had uh, the fight with the cops, you know, and if you were gay and you admitted it, uh, you were arrested. I mean, and today... Now the Supreme Court is uh, deliberating what, what to do with marriage and uh, the idea of marriage, I should say, or the legality of marriage. And uh, it's just fascinating how young people think today as opposed to what was going on when I was a kid. At what point, now we could probably go on for an hour about civil rights with you, I suspect, but I'm just curious about one thing in particular. At what point did, did civil rights issues become so important to you because you, you right from the very beginning always uh, oh yeah from the time i was in high school hmm. incidences that occurred uh, then that uh, one specific incident which i've written about in my uh, jazz memoir book which i presume you know about um uh i was uh, playing football i was on the football team and uh, the quarterback gets hurt and in comes the second string quarterback now i'm going to the most prestigious academic high school in philadelphia called central high school mm. and uh, all boys all with, with iqs all charts etc cetera, etc cetera. so in comes this uh, young african-american kid who was the backup quarterback and the uh coach hollers out Snitzer, you call the plays. And I thought, why should I call the plays? I'm not the quarterback. He is. But then it was so obvious as to why the coach was saying it. Wow. Oh, and I felt embarrassed. I really felt embarrassed. 
And yet, at the same time, I'm 16 years old, and I'm thrilled well. that that he wanted me, or he thought enough of me to call the plays. But uh, it was out of incidences like that that, uh, and, and this was also pre World War II, and anti-Semitism was rampant mm. in the United States back then, and so I was very conscious of this kind of bigotry and it, and it was so obvious that it was not just towards me but it was towards blacks and latinos although we didn't think of it in those terms it was more just black and white we were all oppressed yeah i mean it, it's interesting that the the coach i guess lost his uh waspy uh, quarterback and he had a he had to flip a coin between am i gonna have the the jew call the plays or am I going to have the black guy call the yeah, plays? Yeah, right, right. Well, he made a, he made a choice and uh, it, it, it's, it's too bad he had to uh, say what he said. Yeah. So, uh, well, so it was r right from the very beginning and when I went to New York it was, uh, again, obvious uh, what was going on in certain circles and certainly in the jazz world the prejudice was uh, almost unbearable. Mm. What jazz musicians went through um, in the uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, the cops were all uh, Irish cops <laughs> in New York in those days, and uh, you know, they many of them uh, non-college educated and uh, never uh, living other than within the small group of other Irish folks that they knew. I guess that's unfair for me to say well, but Irish because that's not true either. But too many. Yeah. Too many were, uh, were that way. Well, and it's different the, now. It's completely different. The world is different. Thank goodness. Well, the, the Irish, though, had, had, you know, the first half of the 20th century, they had their own problems. I mean, they were, they were considered by many people no different than the Jews and the blacks. They were, you know, they were considered l l little educated, not very bright. They were, they were manual laborers. They, they came over on the boat. You know, all kinds of things that so you would have thought, I mean, in retrospect, I would have thought in retrospect that they would have had a different attitude towards people who had gone through the same crap that they had. But no, they no. were they were lifted up because there was there were new classes to, to go below them. Well, you, you could see it in the civil rights movement. There was a tremendous close affinity between Jews and blacks. Mm. And many rabbis were right on the forefront of the struggle. Martin Luther, you know, photos of uh, of uh, Rabbi Heschel with uh, arm in arm with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. And uh, you know, oppression is oppression, whether it's um, whether you're white, whether you're black. Mm. You know. Well, let me uh, let me bring us full circle back to uh, photography before we kind of wrap up. Sure. Um, I'm I'm kind of curious, uh, especially as a dad of a someone who may wind up uh, in your business. Uh, is, there, is there any particular advice that you offer to young people uh, about, now, I mean, it's easy to say, don't become a photographer. So we're not talking about that kind of thing. But in terms of, you know, actually see, the way they see the world, the way they interpret the world, and the way they capture the world, is there any advice that you, you know, that you offer? Yeah, I, I, I do teach, or I did teach part-time when I lived up in, uh, <clears throat> in Boston, um, at the Art Institute of Boston. And photography is one of those kind of interesting uh, media where you think the, the resolution is out there, when in fact it's inside. Hmm. And I was drawn to what I was drawn to because of my political, social, emotional reality. And I always say to young kids, what is it that you feel that you want to say something about? Uh, are you involved with uh, the gay world? Do you want to say something about it? Uh, how would you go about doing this? What's in your heart that you want to put onto a piece of paper? Mm -hmm. I mean, you do it with painters, paint, the abstract expressionists, uh, all the history of painting. It's people, Michelangelo and, and uh, the Sistine Chapel. So he was involved with religion and 
How did he manifest that? Well, I, I ask young people today, what is it that you like to do? What is it that you feel about the world? Well, it, 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 it blows their minds because they think that everything is outside and all they have to do is capture it. But it doesn't work that way. I mean, W. Eugene Smith uh, wore photographs and his photographs before he died uh, years later. They, they talked about a humanity that he was all involved with himself. That was his uh, reason for being almost. So that's what I tell young people, and, and it takes them years to digest. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of it's about, a, about their starting point, that they need to know what their starting point is, and that's going to give them their perspective on the world. Yeah, right. it's, it, yeah that's right. That, that's right. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a great searching. I mean, it, because behind every photograph there are these great stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you've proven, right. Yeah, and these stories are what give you validity, I think. Mm. You know, with what you're what you're doing. Even even some of the great fashion photographers mm -hmm. talked about their world and how they saw their world and when they were being interviewed like Richard Avedon. I mean, he was really a visual historian. And we'll go down as such. And I'm hoping that, you know, a hundred years from now, my pictures will still be hanging in museums and galleries. And people will say, oh, that's how it was back then. Mm. Well, okay, mission accomplished. There you go. Well, uh, the last thing I want to touch on is in addition to the uh, show at Eckerd College at the uh, Cobb Gallery, I understand that you recently opened a, a, in a gallery space uh, here in St. Pete. Well, we, we moved uh, our, uh, my wife and I, she's a painter, oh. Carol Dameron is her name, and uh, we were residents of what was called Salt Creek Artworks, which was a oh, huge, yeah. build, huge building on 4th and 16th Avenue South, mm -hmm. which was sold and bulldozed away. Mm. So we just had to find new studio space and new... Uh, showroom space, which we now have done at 2109 Central Avenue, up on the second floor. So it's been terrific. We so, moved in and had a grand opening a couple weekends ago, and we had all kinds of folks come through. It was just very exciting. It sold a lot of work, too, which was uh, very satisfying. And do you have regular gallery hours where the public can come and maybe pick uh, something up? Uh, no, we don't. There are five of us from all former uh, Saw Creek hmm. artists who are on the second floor of this building at 2109 Central, Central Avenue. Central Avenue. <laughs> and uh, when we're there, we're there. And I just give out my phone number and uh, people can call and I can arrange to meet them. And the same thing with my wife and the other artists as well. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's so new. We're trying to. We're now on the trolley stop. We're now part of Art Walk. I mean, so different than when we were way down on 16th Avenue South. Yeah, that was a cool facility. I'd been in there a couple of times. I've had a couple of friends over the years that that worked from there. I didn't know you were there. That was interesting. I'm well, I was there on the second floor for 20 years. Wow. Ah, wow. where were you? <laughs> the first floor. Ah, <laughs> uh, well. Well, listen, folks, uh, you, can, uh, you can experience the work of Herb Snitzer for a limited time at the Eckerd College Cobb Gallery, uh, which is featuring a retrospective of his work called Herb Snitzer, A Life in Photography. Uh, that's through April 5th, 2013. I keep adding the year because a lot of people will see this in many months from now, so we want to make sure that they know they can't go see it there. Yes, right, right. Um, and then uh, Herb will also be featured in a gallery talk on Monday, April 1st, 2013 at 2 p.m., and will appear at a closing reception on Friday, April 5th, 2013. Now, for more information about that, you can call 727-864-7979 or visit the school's website. It's uh, www.eckerd, that's E-C-K-E-R-D dot E-D-U slash events. And as we just discussed, you can visit his, uh, new, his new commercial space, 
maybe he's there, maybe he's not. Take your chances. Uh, it's in downtown. It's sort of downtown. It's kind of the extension of downtown St. Pete. It's uh, 2109 Central Avenue. If you know St. Pete, it's uh, west of uh, Tropicana Field on Central Avenue. It's about five. Let me see. Let me do the math. There. It's about five blocks west of uh, uh, the Trop. Uh, and uh, I think your website is herbsnitzer.com. Herb? www.herbsnitzer.com. Right. W- okay. www.herbsnitzer.com. Now, have you gotten involved with uh, Twitter or Facebook, any of that kind of thing? Very little. <laughs> Just as well. Why waste your time? <laughs> People can, you know, they can get me at herbsnitzer at AOL.com or uh, 692 7646. Okay. I'm not going to give the area code. Let them work a little bit. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have given my number out myself, but okay. Well, it's all right. You're an open guy. <laughs> well, listen, uh, Herb Snitzer, um, it's a pleasure to get to, to know you today and talk to you. And thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. It's been a pleasure, Bob. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media Radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30 day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio and finally if you need a disc jockey for a wedding bar mitzvah corporate event or just a big old party please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs the party authority for all your party entertainment needs you can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com and tell them Mr. Media sent you and thanks for listening Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout.